Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Alex Beanstalk, and I'll be presenting our work, uh, Forward Secret Encry Encrypted RAM, Lower Bounds and Applications. And this is a joint work with Yevgeny Dodis and Kevin Yeo. OK, so uh, what is Forward Secret Encrypted RAM, or FSE RAM, as we call it? Uh, well, it was uh, extensively studied for a long time. Uh, and the goal was to privately and forward secretly outsource the storage of a large data array using small client storage. Okay, uh, and the adversarial model is that uh, the adversary always sees the server storage. Uh, and also we want forward secrecy, uh, meaning that the adversary can leak the client storage. And in this case, of course, everything that is currently stored uh, in the RAM is uh, no longer secure, but we want everything that has since been deleted or overwritten uh, to be secure. Okay, and we also want efficient reads and writes. And for this uh, work, we'll assume a static number of entries n. Okay, and of course, uh, we want to use practical. Uh, uh, namely symmetric crypto. Okay, so what's the trivial solution? Well, let's say we have these eight uh, data items making up our data array. What we'll do is we'll just encrypt every entry with a single key. Okay, so we have this key K uh, in our local client storage. And on the server, we have uh, the encryption of each data item under this key K. Okay, but uh, for security then, we need to refresh the key after each write. Okay, but of course then this is inefficient uh, because we will need to re-encrypt everything. Okay, so there is also a folklore solution that's a, a tree-based scheme. And this is how it works. Uh, on the client side, we again have one key, k epsilon, and it it uh, it's the root of this tree, and it encrypts its two children, k zero and k one, and we store these ciphertexts uh, on the server. Then each of k zero and k one encrypt their children, and uh, at the end, we have the leaves are encrypt, uh, encryptions uh, uh, of the eight data items under their parents. OK, so how do we read? Well, let's say we want to read the fourth data item. Then we take k epsilon, decrypt k0, then using k0, decrypt k01, and finally decrypt d4. Okay, so this was a uh, log n overhead, as you may have realized. Okay, how do we write to a cell? Well, let's say we want to write to cell four, new data d4 prime. Then what we'll do is, in addition to the direct uh, decrypting the direct path to the fourth cell, uh, like we did for reads, we'll also decrypt the copath. Okay, so in addition to decrypting K0, we'll also decrypt K1. In addition to decrypting K01, we'll also decrypt K00. Uh, and in addition to, uh, well, we actually won't decrypt D4, we'll just uh, sort of get rid of it and decrypt D3. And we're left with uh, D3, K1, K00. We'll just forget about everything else and we'll ref, uh, generate a new key, k01 prime, uh, for the parent of d3, and also uh, encrypt d3 and this new data d4 prime under k01 prime. Okay, then we'll generate a new key at the parent of k01 prime, encrypt both of its children, and finally uh, generate a new k epsilon prime and encrypt both of its children. Okay, and so you'll notice now uh, we have forward secrecy because all information about D4 is gone now. Okay, so even if uh, 
the adversary corrupts k epsilon prime. Well, uh, k epsilon prime and everything that we can decrypt with it is totally independent of d4 or anything that could have previously decrypted d4. OK. Uh, so what was the efficiency of this scheme? Well, we had uh, big O of one client storage, big O of n, uh, sorry, that should be server storage, uh, and big O of log n uh, overhead for reads and writes. OK, but we can also further extend this to have big O of s client storage, uh, you know, for some s that's not too big, still sublinear. Uh, big O of n server storage again, uh, and big O of log n over s overhead. Uh, and this is done by just creating uh, s different trees and storing in each tree n over s of the data items. OK, now the main question that we have in this work is, uh, is this scheme optimal? And maybe surprisingly, this has been unknown for two plus decades. And in fact, in our work, uh, we answer that yes, this is the optimal scheme. OK, so for the rest of the talk, uh, first I'll give you uh, some intuition for the lower bound that we prove. Uh, and I'll talk about the model in which we prove it, which is called the symbolic model, and give you the proof intuition in this model. OK, then I'll give some applications of FS ERAM where we sort of circumvent the lower bound. OK, and these applications are forward secret memory checkers, oblivious forward secret encrypted RAM, and forward secret multicast encryption. OK, so first let me present to you the model. Uh, before I do that, I just want to mention that the cell probe model uh, is considered the holy grail uh, for private data structure lower bounds. OK, but in this case, it turned out to be too powerful. OK, so the cell probe model only counts cell probes towards the cost of the protocol itself. So not any other computation, just uh, how many uh, server cells that you touch. OK. But on the other hand, it still requires any adversary attacking the protocol to, to be PPT. Uh, so in fact, there is a trivial uh, big O of one cell probe solution. Uh, and this is done using authentic, uh, uh, sorry, authenticated encryption. And the, the scheme, unfortunately, uh, for the upper bound will not be PP, uh, PPT itself. Uh, but basically, what we'll do is uh, when we go to do a new write, uh, we'll just choose a random authentic authenticated encryption key and encrypt the data under this key, uh, store the encryption on the server, and just forget the key. OK, now any PPT adversary clearly can't break this scheme. Uh, uh, but when, when the protocol goes to read a data item, It'll just try all authenticated encryption keys, uh, which it can do because it's, it has unbounded computation and only needs to download or probe the single cell with the data item. Uh, and it'll just uh, yeah, try all these keys until it succeeds. OK, so uh, here we've shown that the basic cell probe model is too strong. Uh, and what about other models? Well, there's also the balls and bins model that has been used to uh, prove some private data structure lower bounds. Uh, but in this case, it's actually too weak. Uh, and this is because in this model, server cells can only hold encrypted array contents and nothing else. OK, so namely, even the folklore construction for FS ERM is not captured in this model. OK, this is because we have uh, encryptions of keys on the server as well. So the model that we do use in the end is called the symbolic model. Uh, and it's been used uh, recently in other works as well. Uh, and it's actually the perfect in-between of these two models uh, that I mentioned before. 
OK, so what is a symbolic model? Well, in the symbolic model, server cells hold strings that are arbitrarily derived, derived from some structured grammar. OK, and so in our work, uh, we allow for encryption and possibly dual PRF keys, which are basically just uh, random coins. Uh, also, ciphertext from this encryption scheme, secret shares, and data entries themselves. Now, uh, note that strings can be arbitrarily nested combinations of the above. So here's our grammar. Uh, yeah, it encom uh, encompasses uh, all the things I said before. So like keys, ciphertext, uh, yeah, data items, secret shares, all this stuff, and in a nested nature. Okay, so some examples. Well, we could have uh, random coins drawn from our uh, uh, set of random strings, which is represented by capital R. Uh, so we could have random coin little r or little r prime. Uh, we could have some encryption uh, under some PRF computation of some secret share of another encryption of some data item D1. Uh, yeah, and maybe the other secret share uh, of this encryption as well. Okay, so now I'll talk about the allowed derivations in this model. And what I mean by that is uh, the strings that are derived from this grammar don't actually have any meaning. Uh, so really like no meaning and also sort of no representation uh, beyond just uh, being some abstract symbol. Um, so for example, uh, there's no bits in this model. It's just, uh, yeah, each symbol is its own distinct abstract symbol with uh, no exact meaning on its own. Okay, but this so-called entailment relation is what actually captures their meaning. And it's quite intuitive. Basically, for example, uh, you can only decrypt a ciphertext uh, if and only if you have its corresponding key. Uh, with a PRF key, you can compute that, uh, any output of that PRF. Uh, and so going back to the examples of the symbols that we had on our uh, last slide, Assuming two out of two uh, secret sharing, we can derive D1 uh, if and only if we have the following string, strings, uh, R, R prime, uh, this first encryption, and this uh, secret share, right? So what we can do is we'll uh, compute the PRF of R and C, decrypt this first ciphertext, to get uh, now both shares of the encryption of D1. Uh, so we get this encryption and then use R prime to decrypt it. Okay, but if, for example, we were missing uh, the second share of this ciphertext uh, or maybe R prime, then we would not be able to derive D1. Okay, so as part of our lower bound, uh, we define this key data graph. And this key data graph uh, abstracts encodings of the client and server cells and the data array itself. Okay, so for this talk, I'll only consider PRF and encryption for simplicity. So what is the key data graph? Well, it's a directed data, uh, graph at time t, uh, such that its vertices vt are keys that are sampled and still accessible by the protocol, uh, as well as the data entries at time t. And then for the edges, uh, we have one case in which, uh, so for an edge from u to v, uh, it could exist if uh, v is, uh, corresponds to some PRF computation on u, okay? Or also, uh, it could be that U is part of some nested encryption of V. Okay, so if we have, you know, uh, encryption of K1, uh, 
uh, sorry, encryption under K1, of encryption under K2, of encryption under K3, of K, uh, uh, of K4. Uh, then, for example, we'd have edges from each of K1, K2, K3 to K4. OK, uh, and also uh, this edge will exist if uh, such a ciphertext was stored in a server cell at any time in the past. OK, so of course, the folklore construction is easily captured, but it's really much more general, this data graph. OK, so here's an example. Uh, we have that K1 is stored in a secret cell. And we also have the encryption of K2 under K1, of K3 under K1, uh, of D1 under K2, D2 under K2, uh, D4 under K3, and also the nested encryption of, uh, so the ciphertext, which is the encryption of D3 under K3, which is then uh, encrypted under K2. Okay, so this is what our key data graph would look like for this example. And, you know, maybe we also have some other stuff as well. Okay, so what happens uh, if the protocol needs to overwrite D3 in this case? Well, it must forget K1 for forward secrecy. And then it must also forget either K2 or K3. Right? Uh, because if one of them is gone, then this, the, the ciphertext encrypting D3 uh, cannot be decrypted. OK, so let's say we forget K1 and K3. That means that the encryption of uh, D4 under K3, as well, as well as K2 and K3 under K1, and finally, this nested encryption of D3 all become useless, right? Because the protocol itself also will never be able to uh, decrypt these ciphertexts since these keys are gone. Okay, so yeah, correspond the, the ciphertexts corresponding to these edges are all gone now. Okay, so now what's the intuition for the main theorem? Well, we have this first lemma uh, where we say that each data entry must have a path in GT from a vertex representing an encryption key in a secret cell, right? And this is because of correctness. We must somehow be able to derive all data entries and also privacy. Uh, data entries or keys that encrypt them can't just be stored in the clear on the server. So there must be uh, something uh, in the client storage. Okay, uh, and now here's lemma two. So this is just a general graph theoretic lemma. If we take any graph GT uh, uh, satisfying some requirements, but very basic requirements, and we randomly choose uh, a data entry, then the corresponding path from the secret cell key has expected out degree log n over s. And this expectation is just uh, over uh, the random choice of cell to overwrite. OK. And finally, we uh, have our theorem where, yeah, uh, just like lemma two, if we choose a data entry randomly to overwrite in each operation, then in expectation, the contents of log n over s service cells uh, become useless, like in the previous uh, uh, example. OK, and uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the contents that become useless, each operation uh, are unique across operations. So we're, we're never double counting anything. OK, and I just want to emphasize that uh, this, this is agnostic to any random choices that a protocol makes uh, because lemma two holds for any graph. Okay. Uh, so yeah, uh, we can just 
uh, also to take care of nested encryptions, uh, just take the graph with minimum out degree paths to each data entry uh, and apply lemma two to this. Okay, so uh, now uh, the main intuition uh, for some applications. Uh, well, we'll just focus on primitives that already have efficient, uh, meaning uh, big O of log N, tree-based constructions. Okay, and if we naively compose the folklore FSERAM solution with them, uh, we'd get log squared N overhead. Uh, but instead, what we do is we overlay the FSERAM tree with these constructions, uh, the trees in these constructions to uh, retain big O of log N overhead. Okay, so it looks something like this. Uh, maybe this is the uh, other primitive scheme. And this is FSERAM, and we just combine them. Okay, so the first application uh, is on uh, forward secret memory checkers. So uh, recall that for forward secret encrypted RAM, we assumed that the server always returned the correct stored cells to the client for read and write operations. Uh, on the other hand, memory checkers, which have also been uh, very heavily studied in the past, guarantee integrity of uh, the outsourced data array. Okay, and for FS memory checkers, we require both. So FS uh, of the data still holds. And also uh, the protocol should output some error uh, if uh, some tampering has occurred, you know, if the server returns uh, incorrect uh, server cells. Uh, and this should happen even with client state leakages. And what's the intuition? Well, we'll just simply overlay a classical Merkle tree with our uh, folklore FS ERAM construction. Okay, so we'll retain uh, big O of log n overhead, uh, which is optimal with respect to both our FS ERAM lower bound of this work and the most optimal memory checker construction. Uh, and yeah, the best known memory checker lower bound is actually big omega of log n over log log n. So yeah, not, not quite tight with respect to that, but it is tight with respect to uh, the best construction. Okay, so here's what a uh, Merkle tree looks like. Basically, we, we have the data cells at, as the leaves uh, and each of their parents stores a hash of them. Uh, and we sort of recursively carry this through to the root. Okay, so each node uh, stores a hash of its two children. Okay, so how do we combine this with FSERAM? Well, if we look at these two children here, we store uh, an encrypted, uh, sorry, two ciphertext encrypting these data items. And at its parent, uh, we'll start by storing the hash of these two ciphertexts. Okay, and we'll do the same thing for D3 and D4. Uh, and then what we'll do at uh, node 0, 0, and 0, 1, uh, uh, excuse me, at node, uh, yes, sorry, at 0, 0, and 0, 1 is uh, we'll have uh, some key. So the key that decrypts the leaves uh, encrypted under its parent, just as an FS ERAM. Okay. And then at the parent of these two nodes, 0, 0, and 0, 1, we'll store a hash of both the ciphertext of the children and uh, the hashes of the children. Okay, and we'll just carry this through to the rest of the tree. Okay, and uh, for this hash, you can just use collision resistant hash functions, uh, or if you want to avoid the random oracle model, then you can use woofs. Uh, but then, uh, yeah, you need to also include the description of the hash function at each node, uh, and also uh, the word size must be polynomial. Okay, and I'll also note that uh, instead of using hashes, uh, we can just use FSAAD, uh, 
but then uh, we give up on integrity after some leakage occurs, right? Because then the uh, uh, the uh, basically the MAC key uh, is obtained by the adversary, and so uh, she can uh, tamper with anything she wants. Okay. So uh, yeah, how do read and reads and writes work? Well. For reads, it's just the same as in the FSE RAM construction, but we just make sure uh, the hashes of everything we download is okay. And if not, uh, then we output error. Okay, and then for writes, it's also the same, uh, but when we download again, we check the hashes. Uh, and then when we uh, write the, the, the new keys and ciphertext to the server, we also regenerate the hashes. Okay, so efficiency is nice, Os uh, asymptotically the same as before, log n. And for the security intuition, well, if we look at the root key and the hash, then uh, the hash ensures that we have the right ciphertext. Uh, so we correctly decrypt uh, the, the keys at the children. Uh, and we still, of course, have privacy. Okay, and then we can inductively carry it through this same argument. Uh, the keys and the hash decrypted at level i uh, will ensure that the ciphertext at level i plus one decrypt correctly, uh, and we'll still have privacy. Okay, so that's it for uh, FS memory checkers. Now let's talk about oblivious uh, FS ERAM. So FS ERAM on its own does not require patterns of reads and writes to be hidden, uh, but of course, oblivious RAM does require this. Okay, but oblivious RAM does not allow for leakage of client state. So the question we ask is, can we combine these notions? Well, the strongest notion, which uh, gives FS and obliviousness after corruptions, uh, unfortunately is inefficient. And we in fact show an omega n cell probe lower bound, uh, which basically means the trivial solution of uh, decrypting and re-encrypting everything on every read and write uh, is optimal. But we can achieve both modulo client leakage. And what I mean is if leakage occurs, then we have FS as an FS ERAM, uh, but the access pattern is not hidden. Uh, if there is no leakage, then we still have that our access pattern is hidden. Uh, and of course we have uh, vacuous FS. Okay, and we do this with o, big O of log n times F of n overhead uh, for any function that is little omega of one. Okay, and this is almost optimal with respect to uh, the ORAM lower bound and the FS ERAM lower bound. Okay, so what's the intuition for our construction? Well, if we use tree-based ORAMs, then we can overlay the FS ERAM construction on this tree. Uh, but of course, uh, tree-based ORAMs unfortunately require log squared and overhead. But on the other hand, Hierarchical ORMs have recently been shown to achieve uh, optimal log n overhead. Okay, but we can't, of course, easily overlay the tree based FS ERAM construction uh, on these hierarchical ORMs. So, what do we do? Well, we just compose tree based ORMs with hierarchical ORMs. We'll use uh, tree based ORMs and replace the position map in these uh, tree-based ORAMs with hierarchical ORAM. Okay, so I'll show what I mean on this next slide. Uh, so yeah, first we have the position map, uh, which uh, stores a map of each data cell uh, to the leaf in the uh, uh, tree-based ORAM that we use. Okay, and we store this in, in, a, in a hierarchical ORAM. Okay, and we do this because, yeah, this, this, this position map is what causes a tree-based ORAM uh, to have the extra log factor. 
Okay, so then we have our tree where we have k epsilon stored at the root. Uh, and in each interior node, uh, we store encryptions uh, under the node at the parent of data items uh, whose leaf is in the corresponding subtree. Okay, and we uh, uh, pad with dummies if needed so that uh, every, every uh, bucket has the same number of nodes always. Okay, and each of these nodes will have a bucket with a uh, constant many entries. Okay, and yeah, so to augment uh, the tree-based ORAM in the literature uh, with our FSE RAM construction, uh, in each of these nodes, we also store uh, the, the, an encryption of the key at this node under its parent. Okay, then we also have a stash which uh, stores encryptions also under k epsilon uh, of at most uh, little omega log n data items. Okay, so how do we read and write? Uh, let's say we're reading or writing uh, cell i. First, we just look up i in the position map, which because of our hierarchical rem has a uh, big O of log n overhead. Then we retrieve the direct path and copath of i's leaf and uh, decrypt them as in FSE RAM, which of course is big O of log n overhead. And then we retrieve and decrypt the stash, which is at most little omega log n overhead. And if it's a read operation, we just uh, return data di uh, and then continue uh, along the, the next steps. And if it's a, a write operation, uh, then we update the data uh, at, at i. So we, 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 we say we're going to now store di prime. Then in both cases, we pick a new leaf at random for i and store it in the position map, which of course is log n because of our hierarchical ram. Then we put it back in the stash uh, with its corresponding leaf, uh, so the label for its leaf. And uh, then we greedily evict items from the stash uh, to the nodes on the direct path of cell i in the tree. Uh, sorry, it's, it's old leaf in the tree, uh, where we put an, it an item in the node only if its leaf is in the subtree of the node. Okay, and since there is log n such nodes, of course, this is log n overhead. And then finally, we regenerate keys for the tree and re-encrypt the nodes as an FSE RAM and re-encrypt the stash, which is uh, log n overhead. Okay, uh, so yeah, and then uh, obliviousness follows from previous analyses of the tree-based and hierarchical ORAMs. Uh, but, you know, basically, of course, for the PMAP, uh, we have obliviousness from the hierarchical ORAM. Uh, and then for the tree, well, we, we just decrypt and re-encrypt uh, a random root-to-leaf path and copath for each operation. Uh, and uh, also the whole stash, okay? So basically every operation looks the same. Okay, now for our final application, we have uh, forward secret multicast encryption. Uh, so what is multicast? Well, in multicast, uh, a group manager distributes keys to a group of end users. And these users can be replaced uh, at which point uh, the group manager distributes a fresh key to the current users in the group, such that the key is private to everyone else. So namely, uh, everybody that was removed from the group previously and anybody who will be added to the group in the future. Okay, so there's a classical tree-based construction uh, that achieves log n communication and computation. Okay, so our application hopes for stronger security. Uh, and recently, uh, there has, uh, the, the, the community has, has desired stronger security notions regarding state leakage, uh, 
so for example, in continuous group key agreement, uh, we have the same setting as multicast, uh, but there's no group manager. And this serves as the core of secure group messaging protocols. And in continuous group key agreement, user states might, might be leaked and we still want uh, FS and what's called as, uh, what's known as post-compromise security. Okay, but unfortunately this primitive can be very inefficient, big omega of N, communication and computation, uh, per operation in the worst case. Uh, so multicast can be useful for the SGM setting uh, where there's only one administrator uh, who adds and removes users uh, because, you know, of course, we retain this nice login uh, efficiency. Okay, uh, so in this talk, uh, we'll just focus on forward secrecy for uh, the multicast group manager state leakages only and uh, disregard uh, user leakages for now. Okay, and as I just said, we'll retain login, communication, and computation, and also uh, aim for small group manager secret state. Okay, and so the, for the security, what, what we want is if the group manager is corrupted, uh, all previous keys, uh, so group keys should remain secure. Okay, and this is optimal with respect to both our FS ERAM lower bound and previous multicast lower bounds. Okay, so yeah, here's the folklore multicast construction. Uh, we have a tree of keys. Uh, user keys are at the leaves. And the invariant that we want is that users only know the keys at the nodes uh, on their direct path from their leaf to the root. Okay, and the group manager stores the whole tree. So what happens when we, we replace user three with user nine? Uh, well, we put user, uh, user nine's key in the old uh, leaf. Then we generate uh, a new key for its parent and encrypt this key to both children. So both uh, to ID nine and ID four. Then uh, sample a new key for the parent of zero one prime and encrypt to both children. And finally uh, sample uh, a new root key which serves as the group secret, uh, uh, yeah. And uh, the users uh, that, in the, that are in the subtrees just decrypt uh, whichever ciphertext uh, comes first along their direct path uh, to, to acquire uh, the proper keys that it needs uh, to, to maintain this invariant I mentioned on the last slide. Okay, so our first step in making this construction forward secret uh, is the following. Let's say we do the same thing, replace user three with user nine. Uh, then, uh, yeah, at, at each node, we have in addition to uh, a key, also a PRG seed. And the key will actually be a one-time pad key. Okay, uh, and so, uh, yeah, when we replace nine, uh, we have a uh, new seed and key, S3 prime and K3 prime. And uh, we sample a new uh, seed and key at the parent. And then we just do a, a one-time pad of uh, the new key uh, at the parent under both children. Uh, so really also, uh, uh, we want to be able to uh, uh, obtain S1 prime from these uh, encryptions as well. And I sort of just swept that under the rug, but basically you just uh, encrypt a seed that derives both S1 prime and K1 prime. Okay, uh, but now importantly, every user in the subtree as well as the group manager will just uh, ratchet forward uh, the, the two children here, the keys at the two children uh, using a PRG computation on S2 and S3 prime. Okay, and so as soon as a key is used, we delete it. So we have forward secrecy, okay? Because if a group manager is corrupted, then uh, 
all, all the adversary sees is uh, keys that have never been used before. Okay, but unfortunately, the group manager still stores the whole tree. So what we do to remedy this is just overlay our uh, FS ERAM construction uh, on the multicast tree, which the group manager stores. Okay, so uh, let's say we have n equals four. So four users in our group. Well, we have a, a RAM key in the group manager's secret state. So it's client storage. And this RAM key encrypts uh, both the RAM key uh, at its children, as in our FS ERAM folklore construction, uh, but also uh, the seed and key for the multicast construction. Okay, and we just carry this through to the, to the leaves. Okay, so how does a replace work now? Well, if we want to replace ID2 with ID5, uh, we just download and decrypt uh, the direct path and copath of ID2 as in our FSE RAM construction. Then we gen generate the new multicast keys and ciphertext for this path and copath. Uh, and then uh, we just uh, do the same uh, for our FSE RAM component, uh, where we replace the RAM keys on the direct path and regenerate encryptions of the new keys. So both the new uh, RAM keys and also the new seed key pairs. Okay, and uh, yeah, basically security composes uh, because yeah, so uh, we have uh, forward secrecy with respect to our uh, FS ERAM part of the scheme meaning that none of the keys at the old, sorry, none of the old keys at the nodes of the FS ERAM tree can be obtained, meaning when a corruption happens, only the current seed key pairs at the multicast tree can be obtained. And as I said on the last slide, uh, because the keys uh, will have never been used that are corrupted, uh, then we get forward secrecy with respect to uh, previous group keys. Okay, uh, thanks, that's it. Uh, here's a link to our uh, ePrint paper and uh, yeah, I'm happy to ask, uh, answer any questions over email or in the live talk. All right, bye.